Our guest this episode on Fast Forward is the author of a new novel called Seven Eves from HarperCollins. It's Neil Stevenson. Neil, welcome back to Fast Forward. Thank it's good you for, to be back. Thank you for coming. Uh, I have to tell you, when I, when I, usually I never have to worry about forward motion when I'm reading one of your books, whether it's uh, Remedy or uh, Snow Crash or any of the others. It always goes like a rocket ship. But this may be the fastest, most spectacular opening to a novel. I mean, most people don't, and I think we can tell this, this is all, all the publicity, most people don't use the first sentence to blow up the moon. I uh, considered different ways of starting it. I knew that the, that was going to be the initial incident, and I thought about um, you know, setting it up with, with more words, but um, at the end of the day, I really felt it was best to just get the story going uh, and, and not be clearing my throat and kind of setting it all up. So, Well, we're on an Earth that's basically similar to one we can understand on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, some of the characters are actually rather familiar in terms of we can relate them to individuals and personas that we're familiar with now in the media and in politics. But I do have to say, it is fascinating to watch you lay out what people do when they realize that, quite literally, the end of times as we know it is coming in a very short period of time. Uh, I also found the afterword fascinating because it indicated how much work went into this. You started thinking about this in 2006? Yeah, sometime around then. Uh, uh, actually, uh, on further um, research, I think it may have been a couple of years before that, but it, at any point it was when I was working at Blue Origin, the private space company in Seattle, and um, had read a paper about the problem of, of space debris. So. Space age has been going on long enough that we've littered low Earth orbit with spent rocket boosters and dead satellites and so on. And every so often, two of those objects will just happen to collide with each other. And because of their vast uh, relative velocities, they'll shatter, make more pieces. More pieces means more collisions. And so it's been posited by some scientists that this could lead to a chain reaction that would suddenly put so much junk, little bits of junk, into orbit. Uh, that we wouldn't be able to go into space in the manner we've become accustomed to. Um, so that was just a brief kind of uh, uh, point of interest uh, in this one paper. But the, the novelist part of my brain got to thinking, hmm, now that might be a premise for an interesting story if it was a lot bigger, uh, if the, there was a lot more stuff kind of raining down on the Earth. Uh, I could turn that into a space arc novel. So gradually that's what I ended up doing. And what you do is you basically set up a situation where after the moon is destroyed, it's gradual disintegration as pieces collide with each other are basically going to create an incident that is named in the book, and again, because it's in the foreword, I'm not cheating anybody, the white rain, which will basically be... An the, the, white, the white sky. The white sky, which yeah. will then be the, uh, the red rain. The, then followed by the hard rain. The hard rain, yeah. which will be yeah. essentially... A continuous bombardment by various pieces of the moon as they fall down into the sky to the point where basically everything living on Earth is obliterated and, and we're almost back to the, the formation days in terms of the, the hab habitability of the Earth. Uh, and then you follow this remarkable story of a few individuals, a few select individuals, who are given the task of saving this small little piece of humanity with the hope that eventually they can last long enough to either to repopulate the earth in four or five or ten thousand years however long it takes for everything to recover and I and it's really fascinating to watch you do that and at the same time do a serious discussion of the hard science issues that these that they would face in this kind of a thing how did you get all of those elements together, I mean, I know you're kind of omnivorous when it comes to finding out about the science, but the volume of things that you use as, a, as storytelling devices, whether it's the robotics for mining, whether it's the issues of the kinds of vehicles that could be used to bring ferry people up to a future ISS space station as the core for this arc that they're going to create. 
How did you go about putting all those pieces together? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for that very generous uh, description. Um, I have, uh, you know, when I was a little kid, before I could talk, I would sit on the rug in front of my parents' big old console TV and watch the early space missions lift off. So I've been fascinated by space for that long and have been uh, geeking out on it, on rocket engines and, and all of that stuff uh, for my whole life. So. To begin with, I would say I had a pretty decent store of just background information about rockets and space and how it works. And then um, the, uh, uh, the, the time spent uh, at Blue Origin also helped me bone up on that quite a bit. And, um, uh, and finally, you know, I think this is an example of when uh, writing a book slowly may sort of pay off because during the the, the years that I wasn't actively writing it, but it was kind of percolating in the back of my mind, I would occasionally see some little thing and I'd say, hmm, you know, I should remember that because I'll bet I can work that in to, to Seven Eves someday. So um, a lot, that's how a lot of that stuff found its way in there. And I was able to get pretty far into the writing of the book without having to kind of stop and hit the books and go back and do, do research uh, above and beyond just Googling stuff. Um, and then beyond a certain point, it became valuable to, uh, to start talking to, to experts. And I, I just happened to know enough uh, people who were kind of in that business that it was pretty easy in the Seattle area to go find people uh, at the companies like Planetary Resources and Tethers Unlimited who uh, were kind of world leading experts in these matters and to have conversations with them about this. And a lot of the stuff that's in this book is stuff that, quite honestly, people are actually working on now and conceiving and <clears throat> trying to figure out how to put into effect, whether it's uh, the ring of habitats around the Earth, whether it's the idea of this giant pendulum that can, can take you from, from the near space, out, near space and take you up. The, just the using sky hook or the rotator. Just using the sky yeah. hook, yeah. yeah. And, and even some of the jury rig stuff that, that our protagonists, uh, people like Diana and Ivy, are using as they try to expand the ISS into something that is usable as an arc for the small, small shard of humankind that they think they can save before the destruction of everything occurs, are things that people have been talking about and have been positing about for the last 10 to 20 years. Well, that's right, yeah. And um, so if you're a science fiction fan or a space geek, um, you will see a lot of old friends uh, in this book. You know, uh, these ideas like rotivators and uh, O'Neill type rotating space colonies and so on are, are things that have been kind of staples of thinking about space colonization and, and uh, future space transport <clears throat> for, as you point out, for a, a good long while. And you also use as one of the mechanisms that helps people prepare the fact that the nascent privatization of space is put to full use to solve some of the very serious problems that exist in even attempting to preserve this piece of mankind from the total destruction of the Earth. Uh, and some of them are actually the heroes because they're kind of straight ahead people, they don't worry about the bureaucracies of governments and, the, and reach, achieving consensus. They kind of cut through that all, identify a problem and, and try to address it. I'm thinking uh, particularly of, uh, of Sean, uh, Probst. Sean Probst, who yeah. basically is, is, actually it, it's interesting. So many people die and there are so many heroes. It just becomes where, to a certain extent, the level of sacrifice that the characters that you come to know and identify with, the level of sacrifice they're willing to exhibit and, and execute is just absolutely astounding to people who are dealing with the everyday things that we're dealing with now in our current society. Well, my reading of history, uh, for what it's worth, um, suggests that uh, that is frequently how it happens, that you, uh, when, it, when there's a war or a disaster or something like that, um, um, it's not uncommon for people to uh, suddenly exhibit uh, levels of heroism and self-sacrifice that it's very difficult to even imagine uh, sitting here, you know, in, in calm, normal circumstances. So, um, you know, I, uh, uh, that's kind of how I see it. And, um, 
and I also think, uh, not to make this too dark, but I think there's a kind of desperation that would set in where if you're going to spend the rest of your life living in a tin can anyway, um, a tin can that probably doesn't smell very good and <laughs> where you, your, your life expectancy is pretty limited, uh, uh, it, it, it may not give you a real strong incentive to maximize your life expectancy anyhow. Yeah, it, it, risk becomes a relative factor at that point because ev yeah. everything is already so horrific and horrible and cut and dried that, that there isn't anything to hedge. Yeah, yeah. So, but to your earlier point about private uh, space versus government programs, um, that's an interesting uh, thing to, to dwell on a little bit just because, um, you know, they're both such remarkable spheres of activity. So what, what government space programs did uh, is amazing and um, particularly in the early years uh, when they had no idea how to do it and they just pioneered space travel. Um, and and uh, that continues to be true in a lot of ways uh, and without that, without the, the, the base layer of knowledge that they developed, the private space companies wouldn't be able to, to do much. On the other hand, the uh, the private companies are achieving incredible things now. Um, Elon Musk's rocket's going all the way to the International Space Station. Coming, And he's back. getting close to being able to return the, yeah. turn them so they can be reusable, right. which is remarkable. Yeah, that is hard. That is really hard. So, um, so it's important to kind of give due credit to, to both sides of that. And um, so I've tried to set that up in the book as a little bit of a dialogue or a rivalry between... Uh, between those two groups, because um, if you're a, if you're a uh, one of the old line uh, space, you know, governmental space agencies people, you're you're going to see the entrepreneurs as whippersnappers, who don't they're in over their heads, and if you're one of the whippersnappers, you're going to see the old guys as being sort of out of touch and slow and and sluggish. And really, what it is 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 that basically the guys who've built the base have built the base, and these guys are basically a it, there, it's just like the extrapolation that occurs, you know, in terms of the uh, creation of the white sky. It's the same thing. It, it moves faster and faster and faster after the basic really hard, really tough, geez, we don't know anything about this. Yeah. Once that baseline of knowledge is created and you have that in place, some of the other stuff can move much faster. That's right. And another thing I like about this is there are a whole lot of heroes. There are a few villains, but even they have... A rationale for why they are what they are. But again, and I really like this about what you write, you have these incredibly well-developed, strong, central female figures that carry so much of the narrative, especially of this story. I mean, the Seven Eves yeah. is about Seven Eves. Yeah. Uh, why do you feel so, you know, a lot of writers aren't that terribly comfortable, or quite honestly, aren't that good, at representing the female protagonist, and yet you have it essentially as a core element of your storytelling. Well, I think it's just a thing that developed. It's a path-dependent thing. Um, to be fair, it also varies from book to book. So Anathem, for example, was, was relatively weak with female characters just because of, of who, was, uh, uh, who it was about. And, and Seven Eves is the opposite, as you point out. It's sort of intrinsic to this story that it's going to have a lot of female characters. Um, with you know, my first uh, book that kind of broke out was um, Snow Crash, and um, uh, Yt was a, an important female character in that book. Uh, that um, that that women at, at readings would come up and thank me for 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 Yt. So. Uh, it, it kind of became part of the expectation uh, then with, with Diamond Age. Um, oh, that was a fantastic story. Again, yeah. So, so uh, I, I kind of feel at this point like uh, uh, it's, it's expected uh, and it's, made, <laughs> it's caused me to think about that more than I might have uh, otherwise. And, and um, uh, a couple of uh, years ago, I was being interviewed by Jason Ponton at, uh, at MIT. Uh, of uh, the editor of Technology Review, and uh, he he asked me sort of I think half tongue in cheek a sort of challenging question, which is well Neil, people say that you write good female characters, but 
uh, if you really believe in equality, then how come you don't have any bad female characters? Because if they're equal, they should be equally bad as well. Um, so uh, um, so we, we've got some. Oh, we've got <laughs> some in this one. Yeah, yeah. So. And, and actually, they, they, have a, they have a rational explanation for why they are the way they are, and they see nothing wrong with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the, the, the best villains are villains for a reason, right? They're not just mindless, you know. No, e except for the Baroque cycle, one of the things I like about your books is, is they're there. They're a thing. They're whole. They're complete. And I'm, I, I'm assuming that this is, too, although the world is, fa is a fascinating one that I'm sure a lot of people would love to explore more about, especially the last part of the book, which I won't really talk about because I think people need to read that part. I think it, 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 it'll intrigue them even more after they see this great adventure that result, does result in the survival of the species in a form. But have you been tempted yet to think about doing something else in the, in the world that you set up in the second part of this novel? Well, sure. I mean, it's an uh, almost universal feature of fantasy and science fiction books that they, they're about world building. And um, um, I think it's almost an expectation that when you deliver a big new fantasy or sci-fi book that it will have that quality that people will get to the end and they go, okay, well, that was the end of the book. I get it. But wouldn't it be cool to see what happens next? Or wouldn't it be cool to go back? There's that one character that was mentioned a few chapters ago. I'd like to know more about them. And, mm -hmm. you know, so that... Uh, certainly, at least in my personal experience as a reader, the, the books that always drew me in, like Dune and The Lord of the Rings and so on, were the ones that gave me that sense that I was reading only one story embedded in a, a much larger world. So uh, this is one of those. And so the, the latent possibility is always there of doing what you say and, 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 and telling more stories in that world. Uh, there's no uh, fixed plans to do that yet. Um, my strategy was just to kind of get this out and, and do a proper job of it and then kind of sit back and, and, and see what, if, if anything, happened next. Okay. Well, this was a wonderful piece, of, wonderful read for me. I really did enjoy it. Thank you so much for it. And I wish we had more time, but we've, we've, we've hit the end point. Well, you're very welcome. And I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed uh, reading the book. And I'm glad you had me. Uh, in to, to do another interview. It was a delight. Uh, Neil Stevenson, thank you very much for joining us. Well, that's it from this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest. We hope you'll come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Schrod saying, take care. <laughs>